My name is Tom Stifler. I am a member of the Warriors of Quiet Waters Foundation Board of Directors. On behalf of the board, I want to welcome you to the Gene Hastings Memorial Garden celebration. Toward the end of 2020, the board was presented with a challenge, which is how to honor an individual who had done so much for this organization. We were also aware of this person's battle with a serious illness. The person that I am talking about is Gene Hastings. Those here today who knew Jean know that she was part of the driving force which brought Warriors in Quiet Waters from an idea to reality. The board discussion centered around the type of honor that exemplified Jean. We decided that a peaceful garden surrounded by nature was the vehicle for the honor in what better place than here at the Quiet Waters Ranch. The board made this an organizational priority and worked with staff on the project. In April of 2021, the design of the garden was complete and the site selected. In the ceremony here at Quiet Waters Ranch, Jean was presented with an architectural rendering along with a proclamation addressing her unwavering service to the Warriors and Quiet Waters community. I was fortunate enough to be at that ceremony and witness the emotions in the room. I chose the word service carefully in preparing these remarks. Jean's life was that of service to others. Before she became the first mom of Warriors and Quiet Waters, she served our country by marrying Eric, who, as we know, is a career Marine. She served those in the units he was assigned and raised two young men in the meantime who also had outstanding careers in the United States Marine Corps. There's an incident that I am personally familiar with that demonstrates her service ethic. I was an assistant team leader on a fishing experience, FX as we call them. We were fortunate enough to be able to fishing, fish the 16 mile creek on the CR Ranch, which is also, was also known as the Anderson Ranch. Eric drove up there to see how things were going. Toward the end of the day, Eric discovered that he had locked his keys in his truck. <coughs> now I know that's really unlikely, but he did. <laughs> Saul's service was weak at best, but he was able to reach Jean and ask her to bring up a spare set of keys. She got in her car, she drove to the ranch, which if any of you are familiar with this, this, is, this was at the time the, probably the largest working ranch or certainly one of the largest in the state of Montana. So to get where we were was a challenge, to say the least. I asked my warrior if he mind waiting while, until Mrs. Hastings arrived. He said that he was good. Okay, so Gene drove up this dirt road. And you can see the cloud of dust coming up for miles. It's just coming. She finally got to where we were, and I asked, I went over to her, flagged her down, said, would you like me to take you up to where Eric is? Her response was, thank you, but I've been taking care of him for 50 years. I can handle this. <laughs> Serving others was part of Jean's DNA. I personally have had many great moments while in the service of Wars and Quiet Waters. One of my most memorable was that day in April of 2021 when I was able to present that wonderful lady with the drawing that we would become the Gene Hastings Memorial Garden. So again, on behalf of the Board of Directors, welcome and thank you. I will now turn this over to Brian Gilman, our CEO. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here today. I guess that's gonna do what it's gonna do. Thanks for being here to join us to remember and celebrate a life of love, commitment, service, and fidelity, the life of Jean Hastings, and dedicate the, this beautiful garden in memory of her legacy. Regretfully, I did not know Jean well. Jean was quite sick when I joined the Warriors and Quiet Waters team, and I only had a couple of opportunities to visit with Jean, once at her and Eric's home, and another here at the ceremony where we presented the, the proclamation and, and dedicated the garden. <clears throat> 
But I've been blessed to come to know Eric well over the last three years. And their son Chris and I served together in Afghanistan. I've come to know these Marines, these men of principle, who are driven by service, and recognize how they were influenced, how they were shaped by Jean Hastings, her love, her commitment, and the legacy of Jean Hastings. That legacy and commitment and service continues to live on through Eric, Chris, her sons, grandchildren, all tough people who lead lives of, of courage and kindness. I have to also point out that if, if you know Eric well, then you know Jean also had to have an abundance of patience as well. <laughs> and Tom said she raised three Marines, I would contend, or Tom said she raised two Marines, I would contend she raised three. So. <laughs> Jean's legacy also lives on through this organization. Her memory and influence are woven into the very fabric of Warriors in Quiet Waters. This is most apparent in the legacy of love, hope, kindness, and laughter and care that started with Jean and her fellow founding moms and continues to emanate so strongly with our volunteer moms and dads today. This is most eloquently captured in Jean's own words, which are now memorialized on the plaque in Jean Hastings' garden. Quote, when Warriors in Quiet Waters Foundation first started, warriors came to us right out of hospitals with very fresh wounds and prosthetics and pills that didn't seem to work. More than hospital food or balanced nutrition, what they wanted was comfort, comfort food in comfortable, loving surroundings, sitting with their combat buddies, new friends, and being served by women they naturally called them on. All were dealing with unrelenting pain and dislocation. We cooked and cleaned and loved in many places, from Bridger to my home, to Elk Grove, to Gallatin Canyon, to East Gallatin, and now Quiet Waters Ranch Home, with cooking and carrying capacity galore. But what mattered most was being together, surrounded and served by moms, communion in every sense of the word. But Jean's legacy goes even deeper. In fact, I would contend that Jean Hastings made the single most important decision that's ever been made for Wars in Quiet Waters. That was her decision to give Eric permission to pour his heart, energy, time, talent, treasure, and love into founding and building Wars in Quiet Waters into the organization that we've all come to deeply respect and love today. Without that decision that Jean made so many years ago, I don't believe any of us would be here today. Thank you, Jean. Jean's Garden, originally conceptualized by the Board of Directors as a place to memorialize Jean, her legacy, and the legacy of our volunteer moms, has assumed the welcoming, loving nature of its namesake. And because it's become a place where we can all remember and honor all of our loved ones, those departed and those still here. It's a powerful place that is now hallowed ground. Earlier this spring, shortly after we had the pavers installed in the garden, I came up here to the ranch to see it walking around reading the pavers. I was astounded to see my late father's paver side by side with Captain Brent Morrell's paver. <clears throat> Brent was one of my Marines who we lost in Afghanistan in, 2000, in Iraq in 2004. I lost my father in 2015. When I saw the pavers side by side, I was overwhelmed, overwhelmed by emotions that I didn't know I still carried. So I caught my breath, I climbed up onto the ridge, I sat down and I cried. And then looking up at this beautiful ranch, I felt better and I was filled with gratitude for the time I had with these incredible men and for the opportunity I have to be a small part of this amazing organization and its people. Jean Hastings Garden is a powerful place, and I thank the board of directors for their vision and commitment in making it a reality. And now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our founder, Colonel Eric Hastings. Eric. No, it's not two pages. One's an outline of what we were doing today, so don't worry. <laughs> I do have about two hours worth of stories that I'd like to say. <laughs> but I'll try to keep it down. They know me well. They know that uh, uh, I'm long on talk and uh, uh, sometimes short on doing. Um, but first, I'd like to say thanks to Tom Stifler. I know you were part of the idea that came up with this, and uh, I, this wouldn't exist without you, Tom. Uh, Tom Stifler, Phil Uline, Ed Brandt, 
this board, prior boards of directors, uh, prior volunteers, the staff, the ranch caretakers, uh, and Brian and uh, Mary Ann Gilman. Thank you. Through their collective efforts and will, this garden memorial exists, and Jean is highly embarrassed by all this foo and hoorah. Um, when we had the actual dedication, the Lord's timing was absolutely exquisite. One day prior to her having the stroke that led to her final death uh, in eight days, um, and her inability to recognize and, aware, and uh, be aware of what was taking place. Uh, and one day before, she said to her friend Jane Walker, who's here today, let's have the end of this. This is way too much. Let's stop. And uh, it's time for everyone to leave. I think that was something, that's a rough equivalent of what she had to say. Anyway, I want to tell you a little bit about Jean and her caregiver history. Um, Marines are in the service and there's something about servanthood. Well, uh, I thought I had a lot to learn from the Marines. Truth be told, I had a lot to learn from Jean. <coughs> Excuse me. I caught a cold, and of course, I immediately shared it with my son, Chris. You're welcome, Chris. Uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, Marine Corps service. We made multiple deployments. Uh, I went to combat, came back. Uh, um, uh, she had a couple of uh, my sons. Uh, uh, I was occasionally around. Frankly, she made all of the important decisions uh, herself because she had to, because she knew she had to. And she was totally trustworthy. Um, uh, we probably moved before uh, uh, New York. We probably moved, you know, 20, 24, 25 times. I'm not sure. I didn't do the math. Uh, through many of those, Jean bought and sold houses, moved families, sometimes by herself, sometimes ill, uh, sometimes not. Um, but this is the kind of dedication that uh, uh, military spouses uh, uh, have to put it. Uh, put together. Um, and in the audience today, many of you are unaware that I have four people that are so close to me that I can't talk about it. I can't even look at you without crying. And uh, that's uh, Jim McNeese, uh, Dan Brannan, Pat McNeese, and, and Jean Brannan. Uh, they came from Virginia and Maryland to be here to honor Jean, thank you for coming. Um, but they were uh, uh, part of a group of ladies uh, in the squadron, the Black Sheep Squadron, that uh, that absolutely loved Jean. And I I can't believe that I was unaware of the depth and uh, the profundity of their love and respect for Jean. I honestly admit to you, I did not know. Uh, and it only recently came to my attention. Um, that's kind of the level of, of her self-effacing, quiet attitude toward uh, uh, service. <coughs> anyway, um, uh, then I was promoted and uh, I ended up in another command. I was the chief of staff of 1MEF. And uh, so we deployed for Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Uh, I can recall the night before I had to leave, I so told Jean, I said, I can't believe this is happening again. I didn't expect this. I'm so sorry to do this to you. That's okay, Eric, I'll be fine. Um, and uh, uh, your kids are, are just fine. Um, so I left. She held on to me all the way to the airplane and about five days later, later, I got a letter from her that was hand-delivered by a neighbor. He was the chief of staff, 1st Marine Division, John Stenick. And uh, he delivered me my first letter. We didn't have an address. In those days, we didn't have a telephone. You couldn't call. You couldn't send an email. You couldn't do any of that. It was by mail. And Jean had written me in there, um, 
and had bared her soul about what it was like to lose me yet again. And uh, uh, little did I know that, uh, I'm not going to say that, uh, little did I know that uh, uh, she was going to take on the responsibilities of being the one meth family uh, affairs uh, program originator. That didn't, it didn't exist. Uh, and as we all know, uh, the services have done a great job uh, during the current uh, war on terror in terms of taking care of families by comparison to what they used to do. Tom Stifler, uh, Marine Vietnam, he understands that when he left, his mom knew nothing, his father knew nothing, others knew nothing. In Vietnam, no, there was no program for that. Um, and uh, Desert Storm, uh, they said, we need something. There are 50,000 Marines that leave, left Camp Pendleton. Who's going to help take care of the wives and solve these problems? Uh, the Lance Corporal left, and there's no uh, allotment to the child, uh, to, the, to the wife. She's out of money, has no, can't pay the bills. Who's going to do this? How is this going to happen? And my wife took on the responsibility for accomplishing that. Not one word to me that this had been laid on her. And uh, she did it with such... Uh, such an ability that uh, it resulted in several general officers saying to the commandant of the Marine Corps, the four star in charge of 212,000 Marines, saying, there's a woman married to Eric Hastings, who's your representative at Air University in Maxwell, who needs to be recognized for what she accomplished. And they took the time to write an award for the commandant to sign. And he personally flew flew to Montgomery to give her this award. Gene didn't want it. Oh, I'm not coming. Oh, Gene, you know, he's come a long way, and he's a four-star general. Maybe he ought to go. Okay. So... She went, and there's a photograph of the three of us standing there in, uh, in uh, uniform, two of us in uniform, Jean in a dress, and her hands are in front of her, and she's got this look on her face like, I can't believe you did this to me. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so at the end of that command, uh, uh, I uh, had a job was uh, a job offer, and I told Jean, I said, I, I really don't want to do that. I'm exhausted. I'm, I need to do something different. I need to try to do something for myself. She probably thought that's all you've ever done, Eric. <laughs> <coughs> but she didn't say that. She, uh, um, I said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to go to music school and see how much uh, I can do with the piano. And uh, uh, so she said, well, knock yourself out. She didn't think I'd get accepted. I did in New York City. <laughs> and uh, so then we had to go and move up there. And this was a time when uh, Mr. Giuliani was cleaning up the human and dog shit that was spread throughout New York. You all remember what an uh, unpleasant uh, time and uh, uh, situation it was, 1994 in New York City. Uh, and you literally, you wanted to not breathe. It was so oppressing. And uh, Gene said, I'm not sure I can do this. And I said, yeah, you, we can do it. It'll, it'll work. Well, we did it. She thought for two years. Well, it turned out I'm so stupid it took me four years to do it. <laughs> anyway, um, bottom line is uh, uh, my dad called and said I got cancer. And I said, I need to graduate. I'm almost done. Uh, uh, can you wait until I'm uh, finished? And he said, yeah, uh, but I'm going to need some help because uh, I don't want to have to move out. And... Uh, 
So I asked Jean, I said, would you help me care for Dad? And she said, yeah, it's about time. Let's go back to Montana and uh, we'll care for your dad. And my mom needs help. And I've been worried about her for a long time. So she became my father and my mother-in-law's caregiver, uh, as well as my own. Um, well, Jean was not perfect, and I know many of you know that. She had this absolutely crippling jealousy, and there's, uh, those of you who know me probably say, what the hell was she jealous about? <laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, there, there was something about me that, that, uh, that caused this jealousy to come to the fore, and uh, um, we lost a lot of friends for that, uh, for that reason, a lot of potential uh, for that reason. But notwithstanding, um, that, that I just wanted to put it out there that she was great, but she wasn't perfect. Anyway, uh, a couple of years later, I had a life-threatening illness. Jean shepherded me through that life-threatening illness. And then uh, uh, my son had some difficulties and uh, resulted uh, in a divorce, and his daughter, Emma, um, uh, was here, and, and Jean had the attitude that uh, 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 I need to be in Emma's life, and I need to be in your former wife's uh, life, and I will. And those of you who know Jean realized that this woman could pull that off. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's an impossible set of tasks for someone to have done that, but Jean did it. And to gain some perspective, Jean and I decided we would do the purpose-driven life together. And we'd been attending the Bozeman United Methodist Church, and uh, we'd been listening closely to what Dave McConnell had to say. Gene's attitude was, I can leave church and, and cross the street, and, and I'm already angry at the person that uh, tried to run me down at the corner. Um, but uh, notwithstanding, uh, we did this purpose-driven life by Rick Warren together, uh, day by day. It's a 40-day uh, excursion, and, and we, um, you know, we took notes, talked about the lessons that were in there, and I thought, wow, this is really something. And we did that in 2005. All my notes are still in that book from not only 2005, but also 2010. We did the same study a second time. Um, well, fast forward. Uh, believe it or not, this is story number two. I don't know how many stories I've been through, but we went uh, fly fishing for 48-inch northern pike in the Canadian uh, northern territories. I'd catch one 42 inches, she'd catch one 45. I'd catch one 46, she'd catch one 48. It was really beginning to piss me off. <laughs> Uh, so she took a break, and we're sitting there dipping our cups into the purity of this lake and drinking the water right out of the lake. And she said, you know, I wish I could bring a C-130 load of wounded Marines to experience the peace and joy and the hope and serenity of, uh, of this place. And I thought about it, and I said, that's a great idea. Let's talk about it on the drive home. That was the idea from a caregiver that was the start, the nexus of Warriors in Quiet Waters. Um, <clears throat> so I came home, wrote a staff study. Uh, that's what Marines usually do when we can't figure out what to do, <laughs> write, a staff, write a staff study. Anyway, um, we were going to, Chris, going to uh, visit Chris and Kelly in California and do a uh, hospital visit to see whether or not the hospitals would even contemplate letting us have wounded warriors in, in Bozeman, Montana, and uh, be responsible for them. And uh, the amazing thing is they had no programs for wounded warriors, none. They had them housed in, uh, in a, uh, a barracks, uh, guys with no legs, lights out, photophobia, 
terrible situation, but they had no programs for them. There was a guy with an airplane, lots of money, said, well, I'll fly them all to Las Vegas and they can get laid. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> uh, I, that's a true story, by the way. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the head of the combat casualty care, Navy Captain Jennifer Town, said, that's not going to happen. And I said, well, I've got this fly fishing idea in Montana. Will you give us the warriors? And her response was, yes. That was a Navy captain to a Marine colonel. There was that level of trust involved. If you ask for that today, every admiral and general in the place would say not only no, but hell no. But it was a different time. Anyway, um, we came back from the uh, trip. Um, <clears throat> met Volney Steele. It's like a lot of ideas. Uh, you know, there are very few new ideas under the sun. There were several people that had the same idea, but they hadn't done anything about it yet. And uh, Gene's comment to me was, if we do this, it's going to change our lives. No, well, it did. Um, we went to church uh, one Sunday, and the sermon was relevant to water, and Every one of the uh, quotes that were in the, in the bulletin had to do with water. Justice flows down like water. Uh, that's one example. Uh, of course, the quote from the uh, uh, 23rd Psalm, he leads us beside quiet waters. He restores our soul. Jean looked at me and she said, it's going to change our life. And I said, well, let's do it. Um, so Gene spent five years of creating what moms would become through her personal example, caring, cooking. Dottie, there you are. God, I can remember you out at Rich Dunn's house, coming out there, cleaning toilets, making beds, washing the, uh, the linen. That's how we did things then. The moms did everything. And... Uh, you washed your hands and then cooked the meals. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they were Marines. They would have eaten it whether you washed your hands or not. <sighs> so, uh, but the attitude was warriors love to eat, and Gene was right. They did. Uh, we had one uh, double amputee uh, right in the crotch. He lost his legs, and he had one eye, and he had a penetrating brain inju injury, and and his response was, I'm a carnivore. He ate three uh, a pound and a half steaks in one meal. I don't know how the hell, uh, it, and I don't think he weighed 100 pounds total. Uh, oh, it was less than that, maybe 70 pounds. He lost both legs after all. Um, I went into the, into the bathroom where he was staying. He was in a separate room. He was in Rich and, and Doris uh, Dunn's uh, master bedroom, and they had a, a, a spa in there. And he had his pills lined up on this spa. And I am not exaggerating. They were from here to here, bottle after bottle after bottle after bottle after bottle. And he hadn't taken a pill the whole time he was up there. Anyway, uh, another highlight. Gene's ability to care for people was such that we had this, I, I brought him back to be a mentor to this terrifically injured group of servicemen that we had out on the East Gallatin in the 356 Ranch. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, he came, but he got sick. He got this terrible cold. His name was Matt Bradford. He was totally blind. He was a double leg amputee. His attitude was no eyes, no legs, no problem. He knew where everything was. He knew where the chicken on his plate was. My wife tried to cut that chicken for him. No, I know where it is. I can do it. But he was bound and determined to be present with the other warriors at the Sayonara dinner. He said, I cannot stay here. I've got to go to the dinner. 
So Gene drove him from the 356 Ranch to <coughs> Riverside Country Club, where we had dinner, and he was able to be with his fellow Marine warriors and then and listen to the ceremony, and then Gene took him back. But to watch my wife care for this injured Marine, uh, it still brings tears to my eyes. Anyway, last Sunday, we're getting close to the end here. <laughs> Pastor Zach Bechtold had a sermon about Tabitha. Many of you know who Tabitha is. Her Greek name was Dorcas. That stands for antelope or uh, gazelle or something like that. But Luke writes this story in Acts, and, and there's, there's just not a lot, hell of a lot of information. You've got to really dig to get the rest of the story about her. But what she was was a caregiver. She was a, a disciple. She was a woman. She was a woman. And you know where women stand in that society. And then finally she was recognized by the world as a saint. And your coming here today is more recognition than Jean ever expected in life. But you recognize her as a saint among us. Mind you, I'll never call her Dorcas. <laughs> <laughs> One of Jean's favorite passages the fruit of the Spirit. It's from Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, and last of all, faithfulness. We were married 57 years, but her faithfulness extended way beyond me. Trust in the Lord. Every time there was a problem, Jean would say, the Lord will provide. Trust in the Lord. I would say that to people who were raising money. Eh, it'll come. It's manna from heaven. People love us. The Lord wants this to happen. And I believe it. It did. But you look at this place. It's 112 acres, 10,000 square feet. Can you imagine what this would cost in, in uh, today's circumstances? And of course, the guy that owned this, he needed to sell it because he'd gotten himself in trouble with uh, the feds. And uh, so we did get a little bit of a break on it, but it was in the millions when we bought this. And that was a stretch for Warriors in Quiet Waters. And we were doing, I don't know, six or seven events a year, seven or eight, maybe, maybe nine. I'm not sure. I don't remember. Anyway, there was a great deal of, let's just call it due diligence on the part of the board, members of the board. I would call it uh, overdue diligence, excessive due diligence. And those of us that spent time in the Marine Corps recognize there's this simultaneity. You're planning, but you're also executing. You're operating. You're doing. You're, you're not waiting. You're not, you don't string things out in a line, say, this point, this point, this point, this. You don't do it that way. You do it all simultaneously, one step slightly ahead of the other. Well, that was a very difficult for other members of the board to conceptualize and to, to accept. So there was legitimate conflict and doubt within the board of directors as to whether or not this place would ever come to exist. And at, in the middle of this, these discussions that we would have with different board members, uh, Gene got me a plaque and it's a little plaque about like this, and it's got this, it's sewed in there. You know, I don't know what you call that. The ladies know what that is when you sew this message in there. And the message says, and I read it to her. I said, well, what is this? An ounce of doing is worth a pound of talk? I don't, an ounce of doing? 
undismayed, she looked at me, and I can just imagine what was going on in her brain. She should have said, you idiot, but she didn't say, you idiot. She said, it's doing, not doing. <laughs> oh, I get it, yeah. <laughs> Faithfulness and sound advice. Uh, I had to run right over the top of people and probably lost some friendships. Uh, I know I lost some friendships as a result of my absolute insistence. I don't care. We are pressing forward. I didn't quote this plaque that Gene gave me, but... This place exists because an ounce of doing is worth more than a pound of talk. <clears throat> so now we have unbelievable growth in both programming and operations brought to us by a retired Marine colonel. When he was proposed to become the executive director of Warriors in Quiet Waters, this Marine, well, Marines come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and colorations. And so I thought, who do you trust? How are you going to find out? How you don't know this, uh, Brian Gilman. Is he going to be the right person for this organization? And Tom Stifler had given me the right that I didn't rate, but he gave it to me, the right to have a voice in the selection of... of uh, uh, Brian, and I called a person that I trust, my son, Chris, Colonel, retired. I said, Chris, do you know Brian Gilman? He's applied for the job, Marine Colonel. Dad, I know Brian. He's totally trustworthy. Oh, my God, if you can get Brian, get him. Thank you. That's all I need. Now, Brian came here for an interview, but quite frankly, you were hired before you even got interviewed. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, and I know that Tom Stifler felt the same way. Um, meanwhile, uh, my wife got pancreatic cancer, and it was time for me to leave. By the way, that actually came before Brian uh, got here. Um, but what I wanted to say about Brian, uh, I, I, I got off track here. What I wanted to say about Brian was you brought amazing dedication and cap capability and leadership and also a sense of servanthood that very few leaders have. And you were able to develop new programs with consistent with the direction from the board of directors and new operations that have raised the level, the performance, the, the professionalization of this organization to what it is today. And he is now not the executive director. He is the chief executive officer and a man that the board of directors trusts very, very uh, deeply to accomplish the mission of this foundation. Um, so back to my wife's uh, pancreatic cancer. I just want to summarize that her five and a half year fight with pancreatic cancer, uh, that's astounding in and of itself. Usually people live six months, a year with pancreatic cancer. Jean wasn't done. She knew I wasn't done. She knew I needed her help. The Lord provided her with five and a half years of support for me and uh, support for this foundation. And uh, in that process, I can still remember as her abilities to cope with the everyday aspects of life, like going to the bathroom and cleaning herself. It allowed me to become her caregiver in very humbling ways. And I can still recall on my knees by the toilet with Jean, and she's holding on to my head, saying, 
you're so special. Thank you very much. I don't deserve you. I don't know how the hell she could think she didn't deserve me. Uh, anyway, her caregiving, her servanthood, and her faithfulness, and your faithfulness to this foundation and this garden that you have created as a memorial to her means more than you can ever imagine. And thank you for coming all the way from Virginia and Maryland to be here with me. I know that you knew I was going to take more than five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. This is a reading from Eric's cousin, Beth Menser. Gardens feed those who tend them, literally and figuratively. These carefully tended areas bring beauty to the surroundings. They often feed us physically, and finally, gardens allow you to search your soul. Jean Shirley exemplified these quali qualities. She tended and minded the garden of her life, her husband, her children, her grandchildren. All have benefited from her care and attention. Jean always had a smile on her face and in her heart. This smile surely would have won a blue ribbon at any fair. Finally, a garden lets you look into your soul and your being and measure your worth. Jean did all of this and never found it lacking. Thank you, Jean, for your courageous example of a garden well tended. I now want to welcome up Tom Stifler and Eric Hastings. Tom will be presenting the flag that was flown over the garden this morning. Thanks everyone for being with us today. Before we move outside to, to do the ribbon cutting on the garden, I'd, I'd just like to pause and recognize my teammates that worked so hard to make today a reality. Um, you know, it starts with Tom Stifler, who served as the chair of our board of directors at the time that the decision was made to, to create Gene Hastings' garden, the rest of the board of directors. <clears throat> also, Mike Powell, our chief operating officer, and Ryan Olson, our caretaker, who played an enormous role planning and managing all the logistics that, that made Gene Hastings' garden a reality physically. And finally, Liz Scholl, who you just heard up here at the, at the podium, our annual fund manager, who served as our lead planner, lead coordinator, lead doer, and the teammate most responsible for enabling us to be here today. So couldn't happen without them. And I did just ask you all to please give them a round of applause. So at this time, we're, we'd ask you all to move out to the garden, and we're going to have a ribbon cutting. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for coming out. There's a little drizzle coming down. That's not going to stop this. You have, first off, they gave two Marines something sharp. <laughs> You'd never do that, because there'll be blood somewhere. Anyway, this will now be the official opening of the Gene Hastings Memorial Garden. Sir, would you cut the ribbon with me? <laughs> Delighted. Okay, all the way in. 